18C of the Racial Discrimination Act, it's the most talked about uh, anti-free speech law that we have in Australia, but uh, I, I sometimes feel that uh, other uh, anti-free speech laws uh, don't gain as much prominence as they should. should. So mm -hmm. can you uh, talk about some of the other threats to freedom of speech in Australia? Well, we have plenty of those, uh, unfortunately. Uh, even to the point that when it comes to areas that are unexpected, uh, for instance, um, uh, the government has released uh, recently, the federal government, a uh, pamphlet, uh, basically a booklet or something of this nature, saying that um, verbal abuse can be considered uh, grounds for domestic violence order. So if you say something that is inconvenient now in the kitchen, because uh, the, the, the funny thing is that uh, the commissioner, the president of the Australian uh, Human Rights Commission said that what you say in the kitchen should be uh, watched over and, and you could be punished for that. That was her um, desire. But desire is already fulfilled because not even in the kitchen you say think, can say things without getting into trouble and that you can lose your property rights as a result. And that's because the concept of uh, violence has been extended to verbal interactions as well. And so it's really crazy. And uh, in Victoria, you live in the Socialist Republic of Victoria, as, a, as I know. Yeah. They have yeah, they have in the Socialist Republic of Victoria a religious uh, vilification law that is actually used by um, uh, radicals as an instrument of punishment um, to those who question the religious uh, fanatical positions. It's, uh, it's being used as a form of blasphemy law by stealth. And I have some cases uh, coming from uh, this law that are pretty appalling. So this uh, it's a dangerous move. And the Labour Party promises that if they get elected, they are going to introduce blasphemy law by stealth at federal level as well. And um, of course, our Attorney General seems to be unaware of what the law actually stands for because when he was pushing for the change in the legislation, he said that this was to allow people to be bigots. I'm not so sure whether he wants to be a bigot, but the law has nothing to do with bigotry. The law has to do with people feeling offended. And my understanding, as I have tried to explain in my articles, is that the more you are a bigot, the more you feel offended. So the law is actually an invitation for intolerant people to be using this kind of uh, instrument to be silencing those who they happen to, happen to disagree with. So it completely backfires and is actually used as an instrument of intolerance rather than reducing tolerance. Yeah, I've, uh, I've been aware of the, as it's called, the Racial and Religious uh, Tolerance Act for a number of years. And uh, yes, I know of uh, probably the most famous example is uh, Danny Nalia, who's a pastor here, being prosecuted under that law. There, mm -hmm. There's also, um, uh, I'm not sure if you're aware of it, another section of the law. I did, I wrote an article on it uh, last year, I believe, off the top of my head. It's section 47417 of the uh, Criminal Code, which makes mm -hmm. it illegal to offend somebody uh, on the internet. Um, mm -hmm. Is that something that should also be reformed as well? Well, certainly. I think uh, th th one of the things that I find it uh, problematic is the fact that we are supposed to live in a democracy. And the parliamentarians, they feel that they can say and do whatever they want. They can become quite nasty uh, in the uh, interactions in parliament, and they can be quite rude to each other. But they are actually not our bosses. They are actually our employees. I mean, we, if you live in a democracy, the sovereignty belongs to people like you and me, to, to the electors. And, so what's happening with this kind of approach is that they feel that they are superior to us. Some of these laws actually come with this whole idea about um, special ca ca categories of people who are actually protected from the uh, reach of the legislation. So for instance, if you happen to be an enlightened one like myself, I might have some protection for being an academic. I can say certain things that the normal mortal man cannot 
And I think this is really a very stupid and dangerous thing. I contend that if we have a problem one day with problems like ra racism and, and stupid statements, that you come and to become influential, that you actually be coming from academics like myself, because there are plenty of idiots around in academia these days, and they say appalling things, but they seem to be more protected by this law on the grounds of the exceptions for academic purposes or something like that. But if you get drunk in a pub and you are just like a normal person and you say something really silly, then you can actually have your life completely undermined because some uh, person can use that for their own advantage. There is a financial gain in uh, using this kind of approach because you can actually go and blackmail another person. You can actually say, look, if you give me $10,000 or so, I'm going to stop this complaint and then you're going to, you know, uh, make my bank account a little bit fatter, but you're not going to have a lawyer or something like that. So it can be used as an instrument of um, uh, blackmailing. And certainly there is the chilling effect behind as well. So once you start to know that some people on the grounds of fighting against racism got into trouble with a law who pretends to be about uh, uh, preventing racism and it goes the other way around, then you start to really be very afraid about what you might say. Think about those QUT students, that's what I'm talking about. One of them was actually saying that QUT was um, uh, introducing pol policies and adopting policies that uh, uh, prevented him because of the color of his skin on, the, on these grounds to attend a lab. And he was accused of being racist on these grounds. I mean, so now the person who fights against racism is being uh, accused of racism under this uh, legislation that can be used for these purposes and then have the, this whole problem that we know. Yeah, I mean, uh, m most most of the time, if you say something that you know people are offended by or deem politically incorrect, that that'll that'll just be the end of it. But yeah, it, 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 these sort of things, as you mentioned, you know, blackmail being dragged before these commissions, it can happen. Most of the time, it doesn't happen, but it's a possibility. And like what happened to those uh, QUT students, that can potentially uh, ruin your life. Mm -hmm. Yes, of course. I mean, it, uh, if you're not uh, backed up by a, a big organization, if you're just a normal citizen, you will be spending your whole um, money, perhaps even a hundred thousand uh, dollars. Lawyers are very expensive in Australia, don't forget it. And even if you, fa you are found to be completely innocent, who's going to pay for the emotional stress? and all the money they had to spend with lawyers and the legal legal process. I mean, it's, um, it's the chilling effect that's one of the main problems, I guess. Make a point here. Many people think that Australia has more of the rule of law than many countries, but you know, access to justice in this country is just for the privileged people. If you have, if you are rich, you can have a lawyer. If you're very poor, you might get that crappy legal aid, but apart from that, you are screwed. Yeah, that's a, that's an important uh, observation to make, and uh, so, so you do think Australia is worse in this regard, access to justice? I think 90% of the population has difficulty to uh, get access to justice here. Yeah.